episode of the News from Underground, the 15th episode of The Resistance. I'm going to talk first about, uh, this, I guess, a response to a question as to why I identify as an anarchist, uh, firmist, before a voluntarist, before a free market anarchist, or an anarcho-capitalist. And the reason why I, I fight so hard and to reclaim this word, to reclaim the, the symbol, the imagery, the uh, this path towards freedom that uh, other people have hijacked in the past into meaning something else. You know, you have government trying to thwart that into saying that without them, um, there'd be you, you'd have no control over your lives. Uh, you'd have no efficiency. You'd have no society. Uh, and in the media, they turn that and use that in movies, and you know, and that's must have further in the propaganda of uh, violence archetypes, and then that carries forward into. Uh, generational waves of activism in which people have called themselves anarchists yet but use the same methods of the state to try to achieve their ends you know, through violence and you examine all these different approaches and actionable plans that people have tried to put forth towards achieving freedom and the fact that you're still a tax slave implies that they failed the fact that uh, you still have government means <laughs> every approach in the past in trying to achieve real freedom in our lifetime has failed whether that be trying to infiltrate the system of the matrix of the state and trying to um, alleviate it or trying to uh, antagonize cops or trying to do assassination plots or um, bomb making uh, attempts, um, any kind of uh, violent attempt and trying to, or subverting the system through those same similar ways have failed. And you know, it's, it's kind of time to be kind of honest with yourself. You know, what, what is it? Why are you, you know, the people who do advocate for violence and call themselves an anarchist, why are you still continue to, to hit your head against the wall into something that's never worked? You know, you can't, you can't beat the state at their own game of using violence. They know how to do that best, better than you. They have all the trained psychopaths and sociopaths ready without hesitation to aim, pull the trigger without hesitation. And you, you can't, you can't fight against that. Um, you know, you're... It's a distraction, and as much trying to fight the corporations are a distraction from the end game. That it's the Doctor Frankenstein that we're after, not the monsters, not the creations that he creates, not the uh, fictional sock puppets government create, but government itself, the Leviathan. That's the center point. That's what has to end. And you know, a lot of that stuff goes through not giving it legitimacy, not um, giving in or advocating or legitimizing that idea, that belief. Uh, as Larkin Rosa says, that uh, dangerous superstition. And that's, for me, uh, one day I foresee there will come a time, and as some of us are already doing it already and t targeting anarchists, um, like there's this guy in uh, prison right now who's, <laughs> who the, I guess, prison warden is trying to give him a much more difficult life because they found anarchist literature in his jail cell. And so I, I foresee at some point in the future that you see with the National Defense Authorization Act, with the Patriot Act, all these different ways to uh, label protesters as terrorists, as uh, ways to kind of deflect off the uh, deflection of the blame that will soon come uh, with government when people start to realize a lot more that all the problems, all the, the common social denominators, all the social problems and ills is the state. The state then in turn will have their cess pieces in place to try to blame anarchists. We'll try to blame French groups, try to blame uh, people who advocate against the state. And, and that's so much like Hitler tried to do the uh, Reichstag burning and blaming the Jews. And there will be an attempt where one day government will try to do that. And that's so much that they'll try to, to blame it as uh, any other political party or any kind of group that kind of uh, is, uh, is an attack on that political power hold, stronghold that they hold. And for me, though, before that time arrives, uh, we still have a moment. We have still kind of a couple of years to, to take that back, to change the um, media perception, the culture perception, the, the way that people think of the word in terms of anarchy. And there's still time to take it back. There's still time to, uh, to save our community, <laughs> to save civilization from that the West seeks to destroy it. And, you know, to take it back also from a lot of the... Um, no, I, I sympathize. I understand where a lot of the other anarchists in the past, following Emma Goldman, trying to advocate stuff through violence, um, and that just never worked. You know, that allowed the Immigration Act to be passed to kick out all the anarchists back then after the uh, Haymarket affair, after the assassination plots that have failed. Um, there's just different ways for the state to justify to kicking you out. And then, of course, that 
uh, in turn, in that effect, starts to hurt other anarchists who are trying to achieve these ends in a peaceful way. And so, this is a uh, you know a, a process, and not only to dispel the propaganda of the state, but also to reclaim back the word, to give it back its real meaning. You know, it's not just political rulers to, that we're against. We're against any person who claims the authority to initiate force, to initiate that violence onto anyone else. You know, not just a politician, but any individual, and including children. And you know, for for any person for who who says they're an anarchist, but but his their child says they're an anarchist, but uh, legitimizes the state by voting, by advocating for referendums, by advocating for political rulers. You know, there's people saying that Ron Paul is, is an anarchist. He's not. Uh, by definition, we're, we advocate against political rulers. Right? That's to be common sense. Right? You don't uh, say you're an anarchist, that you have this more integrity against all violence, but still advocate for political rulers. Advocate for strangers to rule the lives of other people. Um, so anyone who legitimizes, anyone who says you should legalize this, you should make this illegal, um, any efforts through the state, is, is they're nothing but status and denial. The, the masked um, individuals that go out there and smashing businesses, you know, with, um, with bricks, status and denial. And in turn, what I look to um, Happen, look, look towards happening from this project, from uh, what we're doing here in a few years, uh, the appearance of such will have changed. People eventually will associate anarchists as to do with Buddhists, as to do with uh, non, not people who they already, they would already have seen that these are people who value the non-aggression principle. A lot of this philosophy will already be out there. And then they'll be able to discern objectively themselves that that's not an anarchist. The individual who uh, assaulted this person without, you know, uh, an, an act outside of self-defense is not an anarchist. The individual who stole from a business, who smashes their windows, is not an anarchist. Uh, the individual that advocates for murder, for theft, uh, for for rape, for extortion, for assault, is not an anarchist. Um, you know, it's it's something that uh, that we kind of have to look at more objectively and actually trying to define the terms a lot more objectively too. You know, it's been a loose definition, you know, for quite some time in the past in which a lot of people say, well, they're an anarchist too, but you know, they, they're not. Um, they don't go all the way. You know, they, they still leave compromising values. They still leave compromising lives. And, uh, and an being an anarchist is to not just have the moral integrity to be against all violence, but to, to stand up against that tyranny not to um, buddy up with that tyranny, not to be friends with that tyranny, not to compromise with that tyranny. And so hopefully that uh, answers that question as to why if it was important for me to reclaim the word. And, uh, you know, and to the point to one day when we do finally have freedom in our lifetime, I can stop calling myself an anarchist. I could finally let go of that label. <laughs> I could finally put the um, bolt cutters down. <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, with that, I'll start with the news from underground. Little libraries spread big ideas. Anne Edgerton, who lives in Richmond Museum District, is a regular at Black Hand Coffee Company, often stopping afterwards at a little box with a shingled roof mounted atop a post outside the shop. She lifts up the glass door and browses a stack of books. Shines fiction, romance, how-to, religious, taken a few minutes before she heads home with her pound of coffee grinds and perhaps her next read. The box is part of a little free library, an international fleet of miniature libraries projected to reach 15,000 in 55 countries by the end of 2013. That encourages communities to give and take books without due dates, renewals, or obligations. There are at least eight in the Richmond area that have gained a following in their communities. Regulars, passerbys, and visitors alike can also take a book, donate one, or swap for something in their own collection. That type of connection embodies the spirit of a little free library says Jim Goisinger, the man who reached out to Black Hand Coffee Company owner Clay Gilbert to install their uh, one there two years ago. There's been at least a thousand books in and out without a doubt, Goisinger said. Lo and behold, that book shows up and you can relate to it. Little Free Library was started by Todd Bull, a Wisconsin man who wanted to honor his mother's love for reading. His efforts have evolved into a nonprofit organization that registers to libraries, provides resources for those who stewards them, and promotes a love for reading that builds community. The little libraries tend to have as much an impact on the builder as they do on the neighborhood. Richmond Public Library Director Harriet Coulter said any method that encourages reading does not harm a traditional library's mission. We're just glad that people are ready are reading wherever they can get it, she said. 
uh, which is kind of funny. So you find that people will sometimes say, you know, and as so far, you know, without government, who's going to provide the roads? Without government, who's going to provide libraries? People will. Um, loving, caring individual who love to read um, outside of the extortion funds of the states will create libraries. And, you know, of course, if you're saying, well, these are small little tiny libraries in comparison to the large public libraries, well, you'll find that uh, actually this one philanthropist, Car Carginini, uh, actually donated nearly over 2,000 libraries for free, you know, and through his own foundation for, for public use also. Also private libraries, public libraries. Um, so, you know, people still in the end will, will, will find a way to meet that demand you know, out of generosity. You know, out of kindness, out of because they can, because they want to. Um, and it's funny though, of course, uh, this Richmond Public Library director, and that, uh, well, recently in September, there was an incident that happened up north here from Richmond. There was a Fairfax County Library that uh, just threw away all their books. I mean, hundreds of thousands of books. There was over, I believe, yeah, I guess a little over 200,000 books were found in a dumpster. You know, that was their way to, to save costs. That was their way, that was their actionable plan and trying to make it efficient. Just to throwing stuff away, throwing uh, resources away. Uh, resources, of course, that were paid by your, by your money that was stolen from you. And that's, that's how they take care of that. That's the efficiency of the state. Um, you know, that's not what you'll find in a free market. You know, they'll find it, they'll, they'll liquidate it, they'll find different ways to, to sell it, um, they'll find to, to merge, to, to give away for free. Um, but when the state handles these, these services, uh, they do it in the most ineffective and inefficient way possible. Just by treating uh, the stuff that they steal from you as garbage already. And that's what they do with these books. So I would also suspect that most of the books that they threw away, of course, were would be ones that uh, the ones that they did not throw away would be the ones that advocate for the state, advocate for this uh, political religion, advocate for the need that you need political rulers to tell you how to live your life. I'm pretty sure, and those are the books that stayed on the shelf. But you know, public libraries and just as pretty much any government agency can't keep up with the growing demand of technology with innovation, uh, they stagnate. Uh, they stay in, in idleness. Um, it's difficult for them to, as a business could, feasibly do it you know, in, in an instant uh, to upgrade, to innovate, to update. Um, you know, state industries can't. You know, this is why USPS is having a hard time, $60 billion in debt. And now you have libraries throwing away tens of thousands of books away, throwing you into the garbage. You see Davis Pepper Spray awarded $38,000 in compensation. A former University of California policeman who stirred public outrage by pepper spraying peaceful student protesters has been awarded $38,000 in workers' compensation for psychiatric damages he claimed to have suffered from the 2011 incident. Then campus police Lieutenant John Pike, you guys remember John Pike? He was uh, all, over, all over the news. He's the, the guy you could pretty much find on these pop iconic, um, I guess, paintings of him pepper spraying people's faces, pepper spaying Jesus in the face. Um, so he came to symbolize law enforcement aggression against anti-Wall Street protests at the time when video footage widely aired on TV and in the internet showcased him casually dousing demonstrators in the face with a can of pepper, pepper spray as they sat on the ground. Pike was suspended from his job at UC Davis and ultimately left the force in July. But university officials did not disclose the circumstances of his departure. Of course he wouldn't because uh, this is why they, they didn't want to disclose it. A scathing 190-page report on the incident found that the university officials and UC Davis police used poor judgment and excessive force in the confrontation. And the incident, it's funny because uh, excessive force, that was initiation force. Uh, it's funny how they try to hide with the kind of force, you know, it was excessive, it wasn't appropriate, um, it was not enough. Um, it was the initiation force is what they're trying to hide, um, the initiation of violence. And the incident was mildly mocked in satirical messages posted on the internet when with still photos of Pike wielding his pepper spray were inserted into famed works or art of pop culture images. In June of this year, Pike himself filed a workers' compensation claim at the university over the incident saying he suffered unspecified psychiatric and nervous system damage. Though the document did not explain how he claimed to have been harmed, records show. Um, so that's interesting. I would imagine he already had a lot of unspecified 
uh, nerve system damages when he took it upon himself to commit those sociopathic acts against uh, these peaceful students. Uh, these, these students are just sitting on the ground. They're not initiating force. They're not um, attacking anyone. They're not causing destruction. Uh, but it's, so it's kind of interesting. Let's see where this goes. Uh, so on October 16, the State Division of Workers' Compensation Appeals Board agreed to resolve his claim by paying him a settlement totaling $38,055. The university spokesman Andy Phil said, The San Francisco Chronicle reported that Pike had earned more than $110,000 from his job in 2010. That's a lot of money for, for a sociopath. That's a lot of money for whose someone's job is to initiate force on, on, on peaceful students. Citing a database of state worker salaries from the last year from which figures are available, the newspaper said it had received more than 17,000 angry or threatening emails, 10,000 text messages, and hundreds of letters after the video of pepper spraying went viral. As you should, right? That's, that, I, that's kind of the response you would expect to receive when you act out in such barbaric and disgusting behavior. Um, now that's how you socially ostracize and so people that you're not going to, you know, stand for that kind of behavior in your community. You won't stomach it. You know, you grow a spine, you stand up to that tyranny. Uh, you 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 stand up and you become vocal with your um, displeasure, with your distaste, um, with, with these sort of barbaric fascist acts. University Chancellor Linda Cati had asked prosecutors to look into possible criminal charges against a police officer involved in the pepper spraying, but the Yolo County District Attorney's Office determined there were no grounds on which to bring the case. Of course not. They're all on the same side. They're all on the same team. Fucking sick. And the uh, and that's that goes to show that um, you can't really another area where you can't really win against the state in that particular um, arena that they control and hold and trying to uh, trying to get these agents of the state fired you know they'll still find a way to to get you back they'll still find a way to uh have some of that extortion money they've taken away from you already and it's sick that he got paid over a hundred thousand dollars on unpaid leave right seattle to buy land 103 old three year old woman doesn't want to sell and another uh article about eminent domain an elderly woman was turned down, has turned down the city of Seattle's offer to purchase your prime waterfront parking lot. So what does the city do? The Seattle City Council voted 8-0 to zero to acquire through negotiations or condemnation the waterfront parking lot that belongs to a 103-year-old Spokane woman. Wow. Uh, so these are your local political rulers. And that's something you have to understand in terms of the... If you're going to have an actual plan, you want to have it uh, directed, I guess, in terms of social ostracism to the immediate political rulers to live in your community. Forget the White House, forget your state senators, forget um, the federal level, state level, focus against the political rulers to live in your own city. You know, these will be your zoning code administrators, your foreign marshals, these will be your city, city council members. Um, these will be your, uh, anyone who, like the architectural uh, review boards that tell you that you can't upgrade your own home. You know, they tell you that, sorry, that's, uh, we're trying to keep things in the past. We're not trying to embrace the future. And if you try to change anything in your home, we're just going to find you. And if you don't pay that fine, uh, well, you know, uh, we'll just throw you into a cage. Or you can even lose your home. Um, now, those are the people you have to, to, to see and, and find an actual plan into getting rid of them. Socially ostracize them, socially ostracize the political seats they hold, the position, and that anyone who attempts and dare takes those positions will be shamed, humiliated. The city attorney is authorized to condemn, take, damage, and appropriate steal, stealing. He's authorized to steal the property at 1101 Western Avenue after, quote, just compensation. The city would turn the land over to the Seattle Department of Transportation. Uh, so S dot here in uh, the tax form of Virginia is called VDOT over there, Seattle S dot. Plans to use the lot to make up for the loss of street parking near the waterfront while the Alaskan Way Viaduct Replacement Project continues. This is really hilarious because so uh, they want to make it up for the loss of street parking, but there is already street parking. This woman owns a parking lot. After all, they know Central Waterfront is an important tourist destination, an integral part of the downtown transportation network and generates significant jobs and economic activity. And as such, the city is sensitive to the area's access needs. 
The city does not appear to be as sensitive to Myrtle Walden's wishes. She's the property owner who does not want to sell the lot between Seneca and Spring Streets. She said no thank you to the Seattle's offer, offer several times. Of course, eventually you can't say no to the mafia. And, you know, they're not, they're not ones to play uh, kind and nice with anyways. The Republic parking lot Northwest manages the 134 stall lot. Yes, the city is acquiring a privately owned parking lot to create a city owned lot. Uh, so this has nothing to do with uh, trying to, uh, I guess, maximize efficiency in the city for as a tourist attraction. You know, like all this bullshit reasons that they're trying to, to claim that, you know, it generates economic activity uh, just because they want some of that money. And they feel they can have more access to the money if they own it. Because, of course, if they own it, they'll be able to uh, place their own uh, parking fees and uh, have that going into their coffers. Now, it has nothing to do with uh, caring about you as an individual. It has nothing to do about caring about the community, the city, the, um, the people who live there. That's what political rulers do. That's what uh, that position that they're you know, brainwashed into um, holding what they have to do. And it has nothing to do about taking care of you. Nothing to do about taking care of the poor. Wilson property is worth about $5 million as is, but Realtor says its developed value is around $130 million. This isn't about money to her. She doesn't need it. Wilson is the daughter of spoken railroad builder, Martin Wilson. A few years ago, she gave $3 million to restore Spoken's Fox Theater from the Depression era. So this, again, individuals have a real incentive to care. Individuals, people who are not political rulers, do care about the community, do want to give, do want to create libraries, do want to restore theaters, not the city, not the government. You know, again, everything that they give away or build or create was stolen from other people. That sucks. And uh, the last article I'm gonna read from News from Underground. We could save a thousand lives per year if just 10% of cars were self-driving. In some ways, computers make ideal drivers. They don't drink and then climb behind the wheel. They don't do drugs, get distracted, fall asleep, run red lights or tailgate, and the reaction times are quicker. They do such a good job, in fact, that a new study says self-driving cars and trucks hold the potential to transform driving by eliminating the majority of traffic deaths significantly reducing congestion and providing tens of billions of dollars in economic benefits. But significant hurdles to widespread use of self-driving cars remain, the most important of which is likely to be cost. Added sensors, software, engineering, and power and computing requirements currently tally over $100,000 per vehicle, clearly unaffordable for most people. The study said, but large scale production promises greater affordability over time, it concluded. You know, this is, again, what you can find uh, in any new market product that comes out. And that uh, over time, when you have competition, different ways to kind of create this product in production, uh, the cost of that starts to lower. Quality continues to improve. Again, you can look at the plasma screen TVs that came out several years ago. Huge, thin, but still kind of bulky pieces, and they cost in the thousands of dollars. Today you can buy a really good version for better quality for a much cheaper price for you know a few hundred bucks, and that's that's what you'll find in a free market. You can look that and trace like the evolution of uh, the phone, for example. You know how big and bulky they were, and now they've uh, you know small small size telephones that you can just put put in your pocket now. Now that includes calculators, that includes GPS, that includes uh, you know Google Maps, uh, the internet, uh, phone capabilities, everything condensed you know from a PDA and calculator, all this stuff into one item. So it's how quality and efficiency starts to improve. If 90% of vehicles were self-driving, as many as 21,700 lives per year could be saved. And economic and other benefits could reach a staggering $447 billion, said the study. For example, the passenger compartment may be transformed as former drivers safely work on laptops, eat meals, read books, watch movies, and call friends. Pretty much all I already do right now while I drive. And cars that can be programmed to pack, pick up people, drive them to their destination, and then park by themselves may change the lives of the elderly and disabled by providing critical mobility. Spurred by what some see as the future direction of the auto industry, car makers are stepping up in their research. Uh, here comes the uh, competition. General Motors and Nissan are furthest along, but Audi, BMW, Ford, Mercedes-Benz, Toyota, Volkswagen, and Volvo has also begun testing driverless systems. Google self-driving cars have clocked over 400,000 miles on the California public roads. 
So again, when people say, well, what about the efficiencies? What about different ways to modes of travel and transportation without the government? The, you know, that's, that's what you'll find. You know, the free market will find a way. Um, you know, that would be fun to find a creative solution to driving around without having to, you know, constantly be paying attention. Uh, you can turn it on automatic, you can go on your laptop, you can, you know, relax, you can uh, watch a movie, you know, take a nap. And uh, that's what you'll find in the free market. The free market will lead the way to a prosperous uh, future. Not, not the state. The state destabilizes you. The state prevents that from coming in. And of course, with all this uh, technology that comes and tries to pave that road towards that future, that's where the state comes in with all the regulations and trying to restrict that because you know you have to pay your fine. And the state wants their piece of the action too. And of course, all that money that the state extorts from these businesses could have better been invested in research and development and, and finding ways to make those costs lower, you know, accessible. So with that, uh, you know, that's, that's what will happen. The free market will find a way. So thank you for watching. Thank you for enjoying the resistance. Take good care. See you guys at the Victory Party.